Well, I sure appreciate you uh, tuning in. Hello, Internet. Um, I'm, uh, I'm Dr. Sean Michael Greener, and I have been trying to record this for I don't know how long. And uh, I, I wrote this, uh, What Does the Bible Actually Say About Divorce? And I copyrighted it in 2020. However, what's interesting is I published it, and unfortunately, uh, it bits and pieces of it got picked up, and people did cut and paste and this and that, and um, I didn't think about, uh, I, I just didn't think about how I would put this out, because actually, I put it out originally uncopyrighted, and I didn't think I would need it because I didn't understand social media. But I soon learned that people will copy and paste and put their name on your work. And this is years of work. And when I begin on this, you'll understand why uh, I was a good bit ticked over it, being that I was going to put this out anyway. But, you know, I was going to do it for free. But I don't like people editing it and doing things to it. So this is a piece that for years since I published it without a copyright, it's been edited and reposted by a variety of sources that um, they didn't provide proper attribution uh, to the original researcher, author, which is me. As such, so many copied and pasted it. They used different Bible translations to suit their intent and bias. And they undermined what was a personal and academic curiosity of mine since my divorce and subsequent negative comments from various pastors, professors, and lay people. So I sought the truth from the truth. And I'm confident that what was found not far beneath the surface, um, it's been here for all of us to see from the very beginning. And I can't force anyone to believe a different way. And I'm not going to try. Uh, and indeed, that isn't my intent. So um, there's not some tricky thing to this. Um, it, it, but it is a vital approach. It's, I don't know how I'm going to put this. It is really, really vital to approach this topic with humility and accuracy. The cultural language and biblical context are critically important and I treat them as such. What I do ask is this, and uh, for a lot of people, this is going to make them apoplectic. W once I get into this, you're, you're, some of your heads are going to explode. And that's okay. My head exploded too, but in a good way. But what I, what I want you to make an agreement with me or, or come into agreement with me is not agree to the, to the material. Don't, you don't have to, I'm, it's okay with me if you, if you don't agree with the material. But what I don't want you to do is to turn away and then decry this as heresy, unless you've read and heard the entire presentation in context. Now, if you turn away when you find something which conflicts with your traditional beliefs and traditional teaching, you'll miss the parts which resolve your concerns. You got to give it time and do attention. It is not easy to learn, so patience is critically important. Yet, if at the end you still disagree, at least you demonstrated patience. Now, to understand divorce, we need to begin by looking at what the definition of a biblical marriage is and what it isn't. If we search scripture, we don't find any specific details or directions about how to conduct a marriage ceremony. What we do have um, are the ancient documents, and what they tell us is how marriages were conducted and how we discern that how marriages were performed. What we've discerned in that is that they were steeped in tradition by the time of Yeshua. Now, I'm going to use his proper name, um, but you know him as Jesus. We know that weddings are mentioned many times in the Bible and that Yeshua attended at least one marriage. Of course, we've all read that, um, unless you're very, very new to Scripture and um, learning the Bible and you're new to your faith, 
and that's okay. But that's called the Marriage Feast at Cana, because that's where it was. And that's where he performed his first public miracle, turning big old jugs of water into the best wine the wedding, the wedding guests ever drank. Now, Scripture's very clear about marriage being a divinely established and holy covenant. Scripture is not muddy regarding our obligations to honor the customs of our faith as long as we're honoring the commandments of God. We need to identify what constitutes a, a marriage in God's eyes. Scripture instructs that a couple is married in the eyes of God when the marriage has been consummated by sexual intercourse. The couple specified as male and a female, not they, them, are married in the eyes of God when they are legally married and have had a formal religious wedding. Um, now, th that ceremony could be any size, really. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be huge and it doesn't have to be tiny. It can be whatever size. Um, but what is important is the binding authenticity. Now in Malachi, which is a book of the Bible, uh, Malachi 2, which is chapter 2 and verse 14, Malachi 2, 14, we read that marriage is a holy covenant before Almighty God. In a Hebrew wedding, the two people getting married hold their public ceremony in public to demonstrate their holy and binding commitment toward one another. Now, there's also a signed written agreement to seal the covenant of marriage in the time of Yeshua. It was the covenant commitment before God and man that was very important, and not just any old ceremony to make the front page of the local newspaper or to dominate social media. L let me read it to you. So this is Malachi 2, 14 through 16. This is in the International Standard Version of the New Testament. Um, and I'll... I can talk at some point about that particular translation. Um, I have bazillions of translations, but this one is from the original Hebrew, the most accurate. Yet you ask, for what reason? Because the Lord acts as a witness between you and the wife of your youth, because you were unfaithful to her, your partner, the wife of your covenant. Did he not make them one? And the vestige of the spirit remains in him. And why did he make them one? He was seeking godly offspring. So guard yourselves in your spirit and don't be unfaithful to the wife of your youth. Indeed, the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce along with the one who conceals his violence by outward appearances, says the Lord of the heavenly armies. So guard yourselves carefully and don't be unfaithful. Now, this is to 15 and uh, 16. And hasn't he made them one flesh in order to have spiritual blood relatives? For what the one flesh seeks is a seed from God. Therefore, take heed in your spirit and don't break faith with the wife of your youth. For I hate divorce, says Adonai, the God of Israel, and him who covers his clothing with violence, says Adonai Zuvot. Therefore, take heed to your spirit and don't break faith. If we revisit the ancient traditional Jewish wedding ceremony, there's a lot to learn. All observant Jews, when they marry, have what's referred to as a ketubah, or a marriage contract. They have this drafted. The first commence with the Maccabees, as their husbands, devoid of, devoid of any support, summarily divorced so many Jewish women. This led the rabbis of that era to decide what a binding contract needed to be written. That, that, that it needed to be written. This contract was then and remains to this day to be written in Aramaic. Isn't that interesting? What is incumbent, incumbent upon the husband? What are the husband's responsibilities? The husband accepts marital responsibilities for the wife, such as clothing, food, and shelter, and promises to care for her and her emotional needs. The marriage ceremony is complete once the groom and two witnesses sign it. The bride's father and the groom's father co collaborate in the drafting of the document and sign and attest to the contract before it is provided to the wife. I know. True story. This demonstrates that the husband and wife view marriage as more than simply a physical and emotional union, but also a moral and binding legal commitment. Now, it was then and remains to be forbidden for Jewish couples to live together without 
having this guiding and binding document in place. For Jews, the marriage covenant also represents the covenant between God, Israel, and his people. For followers of the way, biblical marriage depicts the relationship between Yeshua, the bridegroom, and his bride. Romans 13, 1 and 2, uh, that's in the New Testament. The, this is one of the several passages in Scripture that refer to the importance of believers honoring governmental authority in general. Now, I want to caution you, this does not mean what many folks, many pastors, un, unknowing pastors, uh, think it means. It does not mean government in general. It means the Jewish synagogue, not the Roman occupation. Because remember, when this was written, this is the, this is the context of it. They were under Roman occupation. So this is meaning the Jewish synagogue, which was, for Jews, the government. Every per Hold on a second. Now, you might be saying to yourself, well, a lot of pastors would say, well, yeah, but, you know... Um, it, you know, what that really means is that it's the same. It's the same. See, but well, it might have been the, uh, the 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 synagogue then, but 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 now it's it's the government. So yeah, we're to have authority of the government. Isn't that convenient? And the church and the uh, and the governments developed a little bit of a cozy relationship, right? And so they, uh, there was some influence there that the government was influencing the church instead of the other way around. Anyway, this will become clear in a little bit. Well, maybe not clear, but it's what it means, uh, despite what you've been taught. This is maybe the first area where a lot of people will freak out and blow their lids, but it's true. So you don't have to believe it. I'm okay if you don't. Every person must be subject to the governing authorities, again, meaning the Jewish synagogue, not the Roman occupation, for no authority ex exists except by God's permission. The existing authorities have been established by God so that whoever resists the authorities opposes what God has established, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. These verses do not mean what they've often been depicted to mean. Rather, they mean something much, much different. These verses, verses provide position number two. The couple is married in the eyes of God when the couple is legally married, a more substantial biblical basis for support. We find in modern times, when one views marriage as only a legal process, some governments require couples to go against the laws of God to be legally married. Many marriages took place in history well before governmental laws were established for weddings. Now, how do we view those marriages? Even in modernity, some countries have no legal requirements for marriage. So the conclusion must be made that a more contextually accurate biblical position for a believing couple would be to submit to governmental authority, again, religious leaders, not secular government leaders, and recognize the laws of the land, provided the authority does not require them to violate any of the laws of God. Now, in my time as a divorced deacon and as a minister, I've also heard many excuses regarding why legal marriage should not be required. Well, if we marry, we'll lose certain financial benefits. And the example of this is, let's say uh, there's an older couple and they're both widows, and, you know, they need their uh, Social Security, right? And it'll be reduced if they get married. Or maybe maybe uh, some sort of pension, you know. Uh, well, you derive your uh, deceased spouse's pension as long as you are not remarried. So as long as you're a widow or a widower, you can get that money. The more, you know, the larger sum of money. But then, uh, once you do marry, we're going to reduce it. Now, I have bad credit. It'll ruin my spouse's credit if we get married. I've heard that a bunch of times, and, and quite frankly, that does not, um, that doesn't square with me. First of all, if you're getting with somebody who has horrible credit, then you need to think about some of your choices, um, which is not to say that, that everyone with bad credit is a bad person. That's not the case at all. Um, there, there's actually very little correlation between the two. 
But that being said, to be fair, um, sometimes you have to really think about what you're doing because you may be taking on a massive, massive challenge financially uh, if you uh, marry this person. And there may be issues that you really need to resolve before you marry them. I mean, let's face it, if someone has just been a total wreck in their finances and all of a sudden they want to marry you and your finances are good, so so they have a, a credit rating of 440 and you have a credit rating of 890, well, you know what that's going to do to your credit rating? It's going to ruin your credit. Absolutely. So you have to think about who you're marrying. But understand, by marrying, there are consequences. And that's something to be considered by any uh, potential person, you know, person who's potentially going to marry another person. What are the consequences of it? Or I've heard this, when a piece of paper won't make any difference, it's our love and private commitment to each other that matters, not some onerous contract. Well, I get that. I get that. But it does matter. And the Lord always blesses obedience. So Deuteronomy, that's in the Old Testament, uh, chapter 28, verse 2 Moreover, all these blessings will come upon you in abundance if you obey the Lord your God. So the dictionary states that the meaning of divorce or the disillusion of marriage is the final termination of a marital union, canceling the legal duties and responsibilities of marriage and dissolving the bonds of matrimony between parties. Annulment is different in that it's, and you've heard that term, I'm sure, an annulment, we'll just get an annulment. Um, in that it declares that the marriage was null and void, thus annulment, and null and void in the first place, and as though it never existed. In the ancient days, this was most often due to the marriage not having been sexually consummated, or the dowry, um, D-O-W-R-Y, dowry, had been widely exaggerated or not delivered. Now, now this speaks to the cultural context of you know, marriages were arranged then. And, and even in a lot of places today, they're, they're, they're arranged. Um, but back then, the, the marriage was my wedge. Quick, what movie is that from? A movie I've watched a thousand times with my daughter, Princess Bride. I'd give, I'd give all the money in your pocket to watch that movie with my daughter again. Um, so, so maybe somebody, uh, you know, there's an agreement to marry and between, you know, the families. But, you know, she says, look, I'm not having sex with you, you ugly galoot, or whatever she wants to call them. I don't know what she calls them. I don't know what they called people back then. I'm not marrying you. You smell bad. You smell like sheep. Um, or the dowry had been widely exaggerated or not delivered. So... The dowry is is money, right? It's money paid. Hey, you know, you're going to marry my daughter. Here's what you're getting for it. Um, not for nothing, but sometimes maybe that was wildly exaggerated and maybe maybe they just withheld it. Look, I just want you to marry my daughter and uh, that's all that matters. Well, so in, in that case, it could be annulled. It could be as though it never happened. And that's to prevent those types of things. So, what's the understanding of divorce in the Bible? The first biblical discussion of divorce is found in Deuteronomy 24, 1 and 2. When a man has taken a wife and married her, and comes and it comes to pass that she finds no favor in his eyes, because he hath found some uncleanness in her. Maybe she wasn't a virgin. Um, then let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it, in her hand um, and send her out of his house. And when she is departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. Well, when we look at this scripture, it exposes a truth stipulating that when there's an authentic and valid divorce, there are two steps that need to take place. One must first have a legal bill of divorcement drafted and recognized by both parties. And two, there must be a separation or a departure from living together as man and wife. In the Hebrew language and culture, the word for divorce or um, 
I'm trying to think um, what the other word that people use. Not annulment, but there's another word that I, I heard the other day, and I thought, oh, man, I, I need to put that in there. But I'll have to think of it. Um, when I think of it, it'll, you know, we'll, I'll put that in, and we'll add this to the next part, because this is not going to be one. This is, this is a lot. And I know it's a lot to chew, by the way. Um, it, it absolutely is a lot. And um, as a result, you know, it, it can't be done all in one. First of all, the file would be enormous. And uh, I think it's easier sometimes to do a part one, part two, part three type thing. I don't know how many parts it'll be. And I may surprise myself and get all the way through it now, but I just think it's a lot. It's, it's long, you know. Um, this took me years, by the way, to research and write. So in the Hebrew language and culture, the word for divorce comes, and whatever that other word is that I had on my mind, but comes from the Hebrew, kiri, now I'm going to uh, spell this, uh, the transla the translation kind of put in English words or English letters, K E R I Y T H U W T H. Kiri tooth, Kiri tooth. Um, that's Strong's number if you have a Strong's concordance, thirty seven forty eight, and it means to cut a marital bond. So this word is the only Hebrew word translated as divorce or divorcement. 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 I heard this the other day, and I did put it in here. I just put that other spot. The phrase sends her out originates from the Hebrew shalak. Shalak. Um, Strong 7971. 7971. Again, in that Strong's Concordance, it has a meaning ascribed to every word in the Bible. It means to send away or send out so that they do not, pardon me, do not live together as man and wife, it also means to cast out, put out, leave, depart, or send away. This word shalak is used in Genesis 3.23 when Adam and Eve were cast out of the Garden of Eden. The Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden. So shalak is kind of, you could take that as a divorce, a type of divorce. And again, this is Genesis 3.23 uh, the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden. Interesting, I, I just find this fascinating. I think the, the Hebrew uh, and Aramaic is super, super fascinating. But the, the written get or divorce decree must be handed out before he sends her away. In other words, you have to enable her to be free uh, to remarry. Look, if, if you don't want her, you, you can't bind her to you. Uh, just you don't want her for whatever reason, whatever the case may be. You have to give her this get so that she can remarry without being in sin. Now, we as believers in Yeshua, we must understand the two components of divorce and what their respective Hebrew words mean. Now, many well-meaning people state that God forbids divorce, yet in all the research I completed, I cannot find anywhere that God states explicitly, I forbid divorce. Remember, uh, Malachi 2, chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. And hasn't he made them one flesh in order to have spiritual blood relatives? For that, the one flesh seeks, for what the one flesh seeks is a seed from God. Therefore, take heed to your spirit and don't break faith with the wife of your youth. In other words, if she couldn't bear children for whatever reason, he, he could divorce her legally. Now, this was the culture then. Don't, don't throw rocks at me. It's, that was the culture then. If, if, you know, go forth and multiply. And if she couldn't, well, then you could, um, you know, you could, you could divorce her. You could, you could break that. Um, and, uh, but for I hate divorce, says Adonai, the God of Israel, and him who covers the clothing with violence, says Adonai Zavoet. Um, therefore, take heed of your spirit and don't break faith. Now, why doesn't God say he forbids divorce plainly when he easily could have. Instead, he says he hates it. God neither forbids divorce, nor does he hate the people who have been divorced. So if you've been divorced, what I what I want to do is, number one, the people who have never been divorced, God bless you. I'm, I'm excited for that. Uh, I'm happy for that. That is um, a better outcome in many cases than, than, than you know, the, the alternative. 
So let's be fair. You know, it, sometimes uh, in abusive situations, uh, you, you know, good lands. You, you don't want them to stay together because either she's beating on him or he's beating on her. But they, there's no business. They have no business being together. It's not right. It's, it's mistreating another human being. Um, so, but, but, but let me read this. Indeed, the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce along with the one who conceals his violence by outward appearances, says the Lord of heavenly armies. So guard yourselves carefully and don't be unfaithful. Now, Malachi 2.16 said that. Interesting. Now, before you erupt, uh, maybe before your head explodes, you turn apoplectic and you say, hey, you could, you've contradicted yourself. It's critical that you understand that the Hebrew word here is not kiri tooth, kiri tooth, which is divorce, but shalach, shalach, to put away or to put out, to send away. There's a major difference between those two words. The Hebrew word here is not the word for divorce, kirituth, or, but, it, but instead it's shalach, to put out, to send away. And that represents the second component of divorce. Now, due to transliteration, in many Bible uh, translations, that's a transliteration, um, or often it's said mistranslation by some. Um, this is the this happens. I mean, this is just what happens. Um, uh, a translator that that was responsible for that section of what what many of the early Bibles from the original Hebrew, Aramaic, um, and even to some degree uh, from the Greek, they didn't have an understanding really of that. Uh, so they were depending on others and what others had said, but not true Hebrew speakers, ancient Hebrew speakers, readers, or interpreters. So, but the word divorce has been used here instead of putting away. Now, even among my most favored translations of Holy Scripture, there are variances in the final words printed. This for me does not undermine the final authority of the word, the power and the blessing of the word. It simply encourages me to go deeper with the understanding that God himself will make all, thing, all things clear when I am in his presence. There are going to be some things I just simply don't understand. Now, until then, I swim in the same turbulent waters as many other well-meaning believers who have, as once I did, unwittingly misunderstood the whole meaning of this passage. Hey, I thought it meant what I thought it meant too. When we read other verses in the Bible, many of the men were separating from their wives. They weren't giving them a legal divorce bill, a get, and were carelessly marrying foreign women and worshiping their gods. This angered God since their divorce and new marriages were not legal as, as they were not following the teachings of Moses, Moshe. Um, and Moshe, or Moses, Americanized name, received this instruction directly from the Lord God Almighty, which read, Write her a bill of divorcement, kirituth, and give it to her, give it in her hand, and send her out, shalach, of his house. In Malachi 2.15, the Lord says, He is seeking a godly seed. In Malachi 2.11, God speaks of the Israelites' actions of separating from their wives and not giving them a, a bill of divorce, marrying foreign women, and worshiping strange gods. This practice defiled the land and violated the covenant God had made with Israel. Now, in the book of Ezra 10, 11, God commanded the men of Israel to separate from their foreign wives. Now, surely you'll note that these were divinely directed and sanctioned divorces, which he ordered to be annulled as they were outside of his will. Ezra 10, 44, by the way, most of it written in Aramaic, reads that these were not good marriages. Nowhere does it say that God hates divorce, and neither should we hate divorce. It's not optimal, but that's not what God says. Scripture tells us that God has sanctioned thousands of divorces, 
and that God does not like bigamy or a person being married to one person while still being legally married to a different person. But what does Yeshua teach regarding divorce? Now, when we fully understand the Hebrew language regarding divorce and its meaning, we realize what Yeshua teaches. In his instruction, Yeshua reacted to other teachings from certain liberal Pharisees whose teachings were based on the ideas of Rabbi Hillel. Now, Rabbi Hillel died when Yeshua was only a young boy, and his teachings on divorce were very well regarded and practiced. Now, Rabbi Hillel taught that a man could divorce for practically any cause. In contrast, the school of Shammai, who was another rabbi of the day, opposed his thoughts on divorce, stipulating that one could only divorce if the wife or husband were caught in adultery. Now, it's advisable at this point to remind ourselves that in this culture, in this context, punishment for adultery wasn't the wearing of a scarlet A. It wasn't a bad reputation. Instead, it was the death penalty by stoning. At the time of Yeshua, the Sanhedrin, or the Jewish court of the law, they could say that they wanted the death sentence to be given, but had to go to the procurator of Judea, i.e. Pontius Pilate. That's an example of that and petitioned for him to agree to the, permit the Jews to proceed with a death sentence. Now, the Romans in this era did not view adultery as immoral, and, and they were not apologetic about it because they kept many mistresses, as well as having sex with many other married women. Yeshua also had to contend with the problem of the day concerning King Herod Antipas, who stole the wife of Herod Philip, and forced an awful divorce, an unlawful divorce. They knew that the arrest of Yochanan the Immerser, which is uh, John the Baptist, that's his actual name, and this was due to vocal, uh, John's vocal, or Yochanan's vocal rejection of the divorce and remarriage. So what, what this is, is this is explaining that, hey, here's the issue here. You didn't do it the legal way. You did it the wrong way. And because of that, you're in violation of God's law. Now, Yeshua said in Matthew 5.31, this is um, in the New Testament, it was also said, whoever divorces his wife must give her a written notice of divorce. Now, here Yeshua is quoting from Deuteronomy 24.1, as he also mentions the two steps that need to occur. The word in Greek used for put away is apoluo, apoluo, or Strong's Concordance 630, 630, which means to send away, to dismiss, to depart. And it, it means the same as shalach, which means to send out, to send away. And this is a get. When Yeshua uses the word put away, he highlights the second step of divorce. The phrase writing of divorce in Greek is Apostasion, apostasion, Strong's 647, which means a bill of divorce identical to the Hebrew word kiritu, kiritu. In the next verse, Yeshua stated, But I say unto you that whoever shall put away apoluo to send forth his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, apoluo, to send forth, to put away, committeth adultery. Now the Greek word, which in many translations is rendered here as divorce, is incorrectly translated as the word used, uh, apoluo, meaning to send forth, not apostasion, meaning divorce. Yeshua is not saying that whoever marries a divorced woman is committing adultery, but that whoever marries a woman separated from her husband without a legal bill of divorcement or that get that we talked about commits adultery because she's still legally and officially married to her estranged husband. And in Mark 10, chapter 10, verses 11 and 12, Yeshua taught, Whosoever shall put away Apoluo to send forth his wife and marry another committeth adultery against her. And if a woman shall put away Apoluo to send forth her husband, and be married to another, she committeth adultery. Now, in Luke 16, 18, Yeshua repeats the instruction, 
And this you glean as you note the Hebrew words as well as the Greek words. Apeluo is used. Whoever putting away, whosoever putting away Apeluo to send forth his wife and marrieth another committeth and uh, committeth adultery. And whosoever marrieth her that is put away, Apeluo, to send forth her husband and be married, she committeth adultery. Now, in each of the above examples, Yesh was teaching regarding people um, who have separated from their spouses but don't yet have that get. They don't have yet have that legally divorced. They're not yet legally divorced. So what do we understand about adultery? Adultery is a voluntary sexual intercourse between a married person and a partner other than one's lawful spouse. A person is not committing adultery unless one or both parties involved in the intercourse are still legally married. Now, when a person marries and has intercourse, and intercourse with a person who is only separated from their spouse and has not been legally divorced from their spouse, then in the eyes of God, they commit adultery. According to the Word of God, when someone marries a person who has been legally divorced, that marriage and sexual relationship is not an adulterous, adulterous relationship in the eyes of God. As Deuteronomy 24.2 clearly states, a legally divorced woman is free to marry another man. Now, what are the causes of divorce? In Mark 10.2, the Pharisee came to him and asked him, is it lawful for a man to put away Apolluo, his or to send forth his wife, and they, what they were doing is trying to test him, test Jesus, Yeshua. Mark 10, 2, um, I find it interesting. I, I'll, I'll read it to you without stopping to use those words, uh, Apoluo, to send forth. Some Pharisees came to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Remember, what I just said is, that they were doing this to test Yeshua. Do you really know the law? We are reminded of the hypocritical religious Pharisees of the day and how they tried unsuccessfully to trap Yeshua into misquoting or wrongly interpreting scriptures. Note that not all Pharisees were like this. They knew very well Moses' or Moshe's teachings on the subject of divorce. But th what they were doing is they were trying to have a debate with Yeshua so as to validate a reason to kill Yeshua. I know, hard to believe. In Matthew 19, 3, the Pharisees also came come unto him, testing him and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away Apoluo to send forth his wife for every cause? In other words, for any reason at all. The Pharisees constantly tested Yeshua, but they never bested him, which didn't attenuate their obsession with debating and arguing with him because they wanted to kill him. In Mark 10, Yeshua responds, And he answered and said unto them, What did Moses command you? And they said, Moses suffered to write a bill of divorce, apostasion, divorce, and to put her away, apoluo, to send forth. Now we again see that the two steps of a legal scriptural divorce are enumerated. Scripture further states, And Yeshua answered and said unto them, For the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. Now in simple speech, Moses wrote a command like this due to the hardness of their hearts. Divorce like marriage shouldn't be entered into lightly, but sometimes for the sake of the two individuals and for children, it is the better thing that the couple divorces. Um, we do need to try and help the couple to save their marriage if it is reasonable and wise to save. If there's abuse, um, you know, the, the people, I, Christians that, and I've even seen pastors, uh, you know, quantify the level of beating that a woman is taking, or even a man is beating you know, receiving, um, you know, come on now. That's, that's not scriptural at all. And, um, I think it's pretty horrific that they would do that because there's a lot of people, um, in the faith community that are staying with an abusive husband or an abusive 
life because they believe that, you know, the pastors told them and the, maybe the Christian Christian counselor told them that, you know, no, you, you have to stay because you don't want to be a sinner. Now, in my case, it was a very complex situation in which no pastor available to me was skilled in pastoral counseling, nor did they have a fraction of understanding of the actual meaning of uh, scripture in, in Hebrew or Greek. They didn't, any of the pastors, it was a large church, but neither of the pastors had any training in Hebrew or Greek, sadly, none whatsoever. And they freely admitted that pastoral counseling was neither their strong suit nor their calling. The languages were neither their strong suit nor their calling. I beg to differ. While I appreciated their honesty, I was then left without resources other than those who chose to condemn me with scripture they neither understood nor believed. Now, as we sift through scripture, scripture, we observe that Yeshua began his teaching on marriage and divorce in Matthew 5 with the following words, And if thy right hand offends thee, cut it off and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for that one of thy members should perish, and not ha that the whole body should be cast into hell. Now, in another translation, it reads, If a part of your body is causing you to stumble, if it is a snare to you and it is causing you to fall, then you must cut it off so that the rest of your body will not go to hell. Now, in Matthew and Mark, Yeshua highlights the Old Testament in Genesis 5 too, establishing that God instituted marriage and that the couple is significant to him. God loves people over institutions, though, and we should not exalt the institution of marriage above the best interests of the two people involved in the union. As anyone having lived or died in an abusive marriage can attest, it is often unhealthy for the couple to remain together uh, as their constant fighting and arguing are not beneficial to them or their family, which means children. Saving a marriage isn't always prudent or advisable, and so we must heed Yeshua's teaching. It is better to cut it off so that the people involved won't perish and go to hell. It is interesting to note that in Jeremiah 3.8 that it establishes that God was involved in a divorce. And I saw that even though I had sent unfaithful Israel away for all her adulteries and had given her a divorce decree, her treacherous sister Judah didn't fear and she too committed adultery. If it is true that God hates divorce, then you must conclude that scripture is incorrectly translated in Malachi, and all divorces are against his will. If you so conclude this, then how could God give, how could God divorce Israel and still be the holy God? God divorced Israel, but then he forgave and he restored them. God had to divorce Israel so that they would come back in line with his covenant, because God does not break a covenant. Jeremiah 3, 8 through 10. I saw that even though I had sent unfaithful Israel away for all her adulteries and had given her a divorce decree, her treacherous sister Judah didn't fear and she too committed adultery. She took her fornication so lightly that she polluted the land and committed adultery with stones and trees. Yet in all this, her treacherous sister Judah didn't return to me with her whole heart, but rather deceptively declares the Lord. Jeremiah 3, 14 through 18, God says that he will restore them. Return unfaithful people, declares the Lord, for I am your husband. I'll take you, one from a city and two from a family, and I'll bring you to Zion. I'll give you shepherds after my own heart, and they'll shepherd you with the knowledge with knowledge and good sense. And in those days when you increase in numbers and multiply in the land, declares the Lord, People will no longer say the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, and it won't come to mind, and they won't remember it or miss it, nor will it be made again. At that time, people will call Jerusalem or Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all the nations will be gathered to it, to the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem. They'll no longer stubbornly, stubbornly follow their own evil desires. In those days, the house of Judah will walk with the house of Israel, and together they will come to the land that I gave your ancestors as an inheritance. In, Israel, in uh, Isaiah 50, chapter 50, uh, Israel is divorced by God, but this is due to their sin. 
And so he will allow Babylon to capture them and take them into captivity. But he goes on in Isaiah 51 and 52 that he will restore and bring them back. This is what the Lord says. Where is your mother's certificate of divorce with which I sent her away? Or to which of my creditors did I sell you? Look, it's because of your sins that you were sold and because of your transgressions that your mother was sent away. Wow. In Ezra, we also see that God sanctioning, uh, sanctioned divorce. This was uh, against marriages he specifically and explicitly did not permit. In Mark 10, 9, Yeshua states, what therefore God has put together, let not man put asunder. In other words, man must not sever what God has joined together. Though this is difficult for Christians to accept, we must understand that not all marriages are God-ordained. Many people decide for themselves and do not consult with God. Ezra 10, 11 says that God has the right to instruct his children to separate and dissolve a bad marriage when it's outside his will. Ezra 10, 11, now confess this to the Lord God of your ancestors and separate yourselves from the people of the land and from foreign wives. The word asunder in Greek is chorizo, meaning to separate or uh, part to go away. Stated that we must not walk away or separate from the will of God for our lives. Now Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4, if a man chooses to enter into marriage with a woman, but she finds herself displeasing to him because he has found something objectionable about her, he must draw up divorce papers, hand them to her, and then send her out of his house. If she goes out from his house, becomes the wife of another man, and this second husband dislikes her, he also must draw up divorce papers, hand them to her, and then send her away from his house. Should the second husband die, her first husband, who married her and divorced her earlier, must not remarry her because she was defiled since this is detestable to the Lord. Don't defile the land that the Lord your God is about to give you as a possession. Now we have to examine the Hebrew word for favor, chen, uh, Strong's 2580. Um, this is defined as favor, grace, and acceptance. It's derived from the root word chana, uh, Strong's 2603, which means to bend or stoop in kindness to an inferior or show favor to be considerate. In other words, Moses stated that if you no longer have the grace to continue because of some, some uncleanness, you have provision. Grace is the manifestation of God in our lives, and this empowers us to accomplish what we cannot do in our own strength. In the Lord's grace, if our, all, if our action is correct in his eyes, we can do anything. But conversely, without it, we're assured of failure. In Hebrew, the word for uncleanness is eravah, Strong's 6172, which means shame, filthiness, improper behavior, and indecency. Yeshua says in Matthew 532, but I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication. I want you to examine the word for fornication and what it means. The Greek word is porneia, porneia, Strong's 4202, and it means illicit sexual intercourse and idolatry and refers to the act of adultery, fornication, homosexuality, bestiality, bestiality, and includes the worship of false idols. The dictionary defines fornication as any unlawful sex and the worshiping of idols. When is divorce lawful in God's sight? The Old Testament is the source of Yeshua's views on divorce, so let's look at that. Beware of taking a single statement of Yeshua and generalizing it to cover all circumstances. I caution you there. For example, Matthew 19.9 is not the entire story. For example, what if a man is assaulting his wife and children but not committing adultery? Does she remain in an abusive marriage? Well, he beats me, but he uh, doesn't cheat on me, so I guess I can't leave. I've heard that. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that. Honest to goodness. It, it amazes me how many times I've heard it. And it makes me sad. Because those women stay because they think that they're a sinner if they don't. And they think that because 
maybe well-meaning, maybe that's accurate, maybe it isn't, but many folks, many pastors, many Sunday school teachers, many deacons who don't know will tell them, well, he's not cheating on you, so you can't leave him, otherwise you're a sinner. Exodus 21, 7 through 11 provides essential details about what was expected from each partner in a marriage covenant. To the unending dismay of many Christians, this law offers a woman the right to leave her husband. When a man sells his daughter as a servant, she won't go out as the male servants do. If she's displeasing to her master who selected her for himself, he must let her be redeemed. He does not have the right to sell her to foreign people because he has dealt unfairly with her. If he has selected her for his son, he is to treat her according to the ordinance for his daughters. In other words, treat treat her just as though she were one of his daughters. If he takes another woman for himself, he may not withhold from her Uh, from the first, her food, her clothing, or her marital rights. If he does not do these three things for her, she may go out without paying anything at all. Now, this passage imagines a married man who decides to marry a second wife. In this case, his first wife is entitled to expect him to provide her with food, clothing, and sex. Failure to care for and have sexual intercourse with her meant the woman could exit the marriage covenant. In The Hebrew marriage covenant, therefore, included a commitment to five things. Personal loyalty. Now, remember, this is the basis of marriage, a valid marriage. Personal loyalty. In other words, not committing adultery. This is what I said in Deuteronomy 24.1 actually means. To provide nourishment, literally meat, implying more than just the bare necessities. He has to feed her, but feed her well. To provide proper clothing to have sexual intimacy with each other, and to give her husband a son. These things make a marriage. Consequently, if a husband or wife fails in any of these areas, the husband or wife could ask for a divorce. This is the practice even today in the Orthodox observant community. At the time of Yeshua and during the time of the Maccabees, as a result of parental arranged marriages, it was accepted that if the marriage irretrievably broke down, the man would give the wife a divorce decree that they would get from the Jewish legal court, which is the Sanhedrin, at at the time of Yeshua. And since the diaspora, uh, the bit din, um, and the husband would then send her out, uh, a bit din, um, house of judgment, um, and Ashkenazic um, base din is is a rabbinical court of Judaism. In ancient times, it was the building block of legal system in the biblical land of Israel. So when they say authority um, in the passage that I spoke of before, this is what it meant. It did not mean secular authority. So this wasn't done hastily. They, They would appear before the Sanhedrin and family and friends would be brought in to attempt to repair and heal the marriage. Today, a man still has to go to a Bet Din Uh, and state his case for an irretrievable breakdown. The wife would then be brought in and and be spoken to to determine the problem and cause. The Beit Din would then attempt to solve the issues, collaborating with social workers and counselors. And if this wasn't effective, as long as the wife is willing to receive the get or the divorce decree, the Beit Din will grant a divorce. This then permits both parties to, to remarry. A scribe on parchment writes the divorce decree and cannot have any spaces to be filled in later or any errors. It is typically written out by the scribe straight after the Beit Din has granted the divorce to the man who will then call the wife into the Beit Din and she will be told that they are now officially divorced in the eyes of the Jewish law, court, and before Almighty God. Now, Jewish law stipulates that if their spouse abuses a man or a wife, they and they have proof of it, the Lord permits them to be divorced. First, they must obtain the divorce decree, and then the sending out. It's worth pointing out here that many people need to leave an abusive marriage before the sending out can take place, as their lives are in danger. And it is clear that the Lord would not want them to remain in a home 
where they would be subject to further abuse while the divorce is taking place. Now, in this final section, I, I examine the, and I applaud you if you've stayed with me this long, um, I examine the New Testament regarding a person ordained as a deacon or pastor. And I'm, I'm going to stop it here because this is very, very important that we take our time with this because much of this has just been, uh, people have been brutalized by the church and and maybe well-meaning people in the church, but people that are ignorant of the truth as it relates to this. Um, and so they guess at it and they kind of put in a little bit of their own preference. And I always say, let not your preference be your theology. So I'm going to examine this about as it relates to a deacon or a pastor. And, and this personally and directly impacted me since I was divorced decades ago. So we're going to pick up with this in this section in the next part, um, part two. And I thank you for hanging on. Please don't give up. It is going to be okay.